Okay, good morning. Today we're going to have, before I give the midterm exam, I'm going to talk about or do a teach back on the chapters that were supposed to be covered, which is included in the midterm exam, which includes a lot of important topics. One of them would be your acid base disorders, right? So, why is that crucial? Because when you work in the hospital setting, you have a lot of patients with acid base disorders, right? So the important thing here is to be able to differentiate one from the other. You can either have an acid or a basic condition, which could either be what? Respiratory or what? <coughs> Metabolic. So obviously, as I said, everything we do here, everything we learn about is about anatomy. So whenever you think of respiratory, you think of what organ? Lungs. The lung, of course. It's obvious. It's the lung, right? The lung is involved here. Anything outside the lung would be metabolic, and we're going to discuss that in detail later. So if I say it could either, you know what's the normal pH of your blood? 7.35 to what? 45. 7.45. You're supposed to memorize that, right? It's the normal pH of your blood. Blood pH, or serum pH. Serum means blood. What's the normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood? 35 to 45, what about your O2, 80 to 100, and of course, what about your bicarbonates, HCO3 minus, 22 to 26, is considered normal, so that's a range. Why do you need to memorize that? Because anything below or above the range is not normal. The normal range for pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So you say a patient is acidic when the blood pH is less than what? And you pay, say a patient is alkaline when the blood pH is what? Greater than 7.45. Do you understand? The idea here, therefore, is that without knowing that normal range value, you're going to be in deep stool. Right? Why? Because how can you tell if the patient is acidic or not, or alkaline or not, right? Normal pH, less than 735, acidic, alkaline, if it's above 7.45. Now, in the review of the anatomy of the, uh, the respiratory system, of course, you inhale through the nose or inhale to the mouth, it goes to the nasopharynx or on the ring of pharynx, then the larynx, right? This is the epiglottis, the vocal cords are here. That's where the air will enter first. It goes into the trachea, and your primary bronchus, <coughs> one on the right, one on the left, secondary bronchus, tertiary bronchus, and then eventually you have your bronchioles. Then air is out. All of these, from the larynx, made up of the epiglottis, and the glottis, and the cricoid, and the thyroid cartilage. All of them are made of cartilage. Trachea is also made of cartilage. The primary, secondary, tertiary bronchus are made of cartilage. The bronchioles are lined with what? Here. Smooth muscle. what? Muscle. That's the reason why, for those of you who have an allergy and develop an asthmatic attack, what does the allergen do? The allergen triggers the muscles here to what? Contract. When muscles contract or go into muscle spasm, you have bronchospasm, it leads to bronchoconstriction. And when there is bronchoconstriction, it narrows the airways. It's difficult for the patient to bring in air and bring out the air. There is what? That's why it's called obstruction of the airways, right? And they end up with a sound called <laughs> Are they having a good time? Yeah. They can die. Because there is now bronchospasm, right? Now, anyway. The bottom line, therefore, is that the air sac is lined with squamous cells, flat cells, to facilitate the exchange of gases called diffusion. What is found inside the airway and the air sac, class? Air. Air, of course. What else would it be? Don't you love anatomy? What's inside an air sac? Air. <coughs> what's inside a blood vessel? Blood. So what's the name of the blood vessel here, right beside the air sac? Pulmonary what? What's the smallest blood vessel? 
Perfect. Capillaries. The so same thing. Capillaries are lined with squamous flat cells like this. Flat cells there. Why? Because that would be ideal for exchange of gases to take place. So, if you remember the anatomy of the heart and the lungs, the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, carries blood rich in carbon dioxide. This blood passes through the pulmonary trunk, then eventually into the pulmonary artery. So the blood from the pulmonary artery carries what? Blood rich in CO2. Okay? And this is transported by what cell? The red blood cell. So if the red blood cell was a bus, who is the passenger here? Carbon dioxide. Why? It came from the pulmonary artery, which came from the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk came from the right ventricle of the heart. Blood came from the right atrium, and it came from the vein, the vena cava. So what happens is that here, diffusion occurs. CO2 will what? Move from high concentration to low, and what do you do with the CO2? Exhale. Exhale. And what do you do with the O2? Inhale. O2 is inhaled, O2 goes in, and who becomes the new passenger of the red bus or red blood cell? O2. O2, and O2 comes out via the pulmonary what? Veins. veins. And it is the pulmonary veins that goes back to the left atrium of the heart, the left ventricle, aorta, and then, of course, the oxygenated blood will now be transported via the 405 north and 405 south freeway called the aortic freeway. Are you following? Now, what does it have to do with this? Simple. Have you heard of pneumonia? What exactly is pneumonia? Lung infection, right? In pneumonia, what was that sound coming from? <coughs> in pneumonia patients, there's an infection. There is over secretion of mucus and phlegm. What does the phlegm do and the mucus do? It blocks the airway partially. So what happens is this. When the CO2 was supposed to come out, will it be able to come out? No. If this is blocked by the mucus, the CO2 cannot get out, guess what? The carbon dioxide will go back where? To the blood, through the air sac, and into the blood vessel. Therefore, what happens to the CO2 levels in this situation? It's going up. Okay, remember the word CO2 plus H2O? H2CO3. This is called carbonic what? Acid. And what, what is a carbonic acid? Is that an acid? Don't you love anatomy and physiology? It's so simple. If you combine CO2, H2O, which is water in the lung, it becomes H2CO2 plus O1, O3. And an acid. In patients, therefore, with pneumonia, Patients with COPD, such as asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema, the common denominator is that there is what? Airway obstruction, which prevents the release of what? Carbon dioxide, at the same time prevents the oxygen from coming in. In other words, in respiratory acidosis, you end up acidic blood, because the CO2 is not able to go out, and at the same time, what happens to the part PCO2 levels? Up or up? Greater than 45. <coughs> Do you understand? Why will it be greater? Because it was not able to get out. It went back. It, this is the block here. The mucus prevented it from going out. It, by reverse movement, it goes back to the air sac. It goes back to where? The blood. It's the reason why the blood levels are high. When I tell my nurses, when I used to practice medicine before I migrated here, we get the blood specimen from the artery, that's why it's called ABG. What does ABG stand for? Arterial blood gases. And you can see the blood, get the blood result, ABG, you can see that it will be elevated, it will be greater than 45. The pH will be less than 7.35. Okay? Are you following me? So the bottom line here is that because there's not enough oxygen going in and CO2 is not able to go out, you are in a situation that is what? Hypoventilation. So what is happening in acidic conditions? Hypoventilation. Hypo what? Okay, now, 
What do you think we do here? Will I tell the nurse to suction the secretions? Yes. Will I tell the nurse to give a mucolytic drug? What do you mean by lytic or lysis? Break down the mucus. Yes. Why? Because what is causing the airway obstruction? Mucus. The mucus. So we are men and women of science. I want you to have a very smart mind that you'll understand what the hell is this doing to the patient. This drug called mucolytic drug, very commonly, well, you don't have to know this now, s carboxymethylcysteine. Some of these drugs, they, they mucilox, mu, you know, mucocysteine, they're designed to do that. It's designed to dissolve this so that it would be easier for the blood of the oxygen to go out or in and our carbon dioxide to go out. What else? Are we going to give a bronchodilator here? Yeah. In the bronchioles, what will that drug do? It will make the smooth muscles relax, bringing about what? Bronchodilation. Will that affect your patient? Improve the patient's condition? Will I prescribe pulmonary physiotherapy? Mm -hmm. By doing postural drainage? Yes? In other words, whatever we do is designed to treat the problem. That is how you become a smart nurse. Whatever the doctor is telling you to do, you have to ask yourself, why did Dr. Gamo order me to give a mucolytic drug? To dissolve the mucus, to get rid of the airway obstruction provided by the mucus. Second, why did Dr. Gamo give a bronchodilator? Because you want to open up the airways. Why did Dr. Gamo order the uh, giving of nebulization? You know, nebulization, mm -hmm. breathing treatment. And most often than not, we put a bronchodilator there in, in the medication attached to the, it's water, and you know, you, you've, you've probably heard about it. you have a nebulizer at home, right? Or humidifier, I'll similar to that. Yeah. But it's better than that, okay? And if there is an infection, antibiotic treatment, how do you determine which is the co uh, organism causing the uh, infection? Sputum culture and sensitivity testing, right? Do you understand? Now, what about here in respiratory alkalosis? In the term we use is hyper what? Ventilation. Ventilation. Example, a 18 year old woman had a panic anxiety attack. Oh my God, my boyfriend broke up with me. What do I do now? <laughs> what do you tell that woman? Find another boyfriend. <laughs> Duh. But I'm married, so I can't be. Other gentlemen here are single, they could be your boyfriend, right? Okay. I can be your friend. <laughs> now, I'm just joking, okay, of course. What do you do? For these women, I'm not saying all women are, have anxiety attack. I think mostly it's a stereotype, you know. Or a man or a woman who was taking an exam today, like a midterm exam in a few minutes. Oh my God, I'm not ready yet. What do I do? <laughs> So every time you hyperventilate, you're releasing what? CO2. CO2 into the air. Every time you do that, every time you think of CO2, you think of what? Acid. Every time so when you hyperventilate, pretend it's a CO2. Where is the CO2 now? Out. I become what? Alkaline. And what is that? Alkalosis. Alkalosis. Can you do me a favor? Can you get my, my CO2? In other words, what I'm trying to say, okay, is that you would expect the pH to be what? Greater than 45, what else? You would expect the PCO2 to be high or low? No. Low. Very simple. Why? Less than 35, right? Mm -hmm. Less than 35 for PCO2. So whenever you're given an exam or test where the PCO2 level is low, and they would say this is an 18-year-old female patient with an anxiety attack, bam! Respiratory alkalosis, bam! pH greater than 7.45, bam! PCO2 will be less than 35, bam! That's how you pass the nursing board exam. Because you have to think fast, answer fast. If this were a real life situation, act fast. Now, what do you think we do for these patients? Relax. Hmm? Relax. Relax, Relax chill. Yeah. So am I going to give a tranquilizer, like volume? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, what's your name, dear? Dana. 
Would I give Valium or tranquilizer or a sedative? Yeah. Of course, I will, but not enough to cause an overdose, right? No, no. Will I give 100 tablets or one tablet of 5 milligrams? One tablet will be fine, right? Because, because you, you want to relax the patient. Relief. Sedate tranquilizer is a drug of choice, but not too much, because if you give too much and they get an overdose, you stop the medulla, which is the respiratory center, and he dies or she dies. Enough to sedate and relax. Chill. Relax, don't worry. You'll be ready for the midterm exam. You've been studying for two weeks, okay? Or you have a, meet another guy. I'll, I'll arrange a date for you, young lady. It's not the end of the world, right? So, psychological counseling. But what else? Have you heard? Yes? Okay, why brown paper? I don't even know what they say, brown bag. You know, it's brown paper, but why? Ms. Um, Dilly, tell me why. So tell me why, tell me why. Yes? They'll breathe the CO2 back in. Very good. So you're a thinking student. I like to hire you now as a nurse. <laughs> so, pretend this is a paper bag. Right? Oh my God, I just lost my boyfriend. Oh, I just lost my dog. What will I do now? So the same paper bag is sealed. Mm -hmm. So every time you exhale the CO2, you will be able to re-inhale what? CO2 again. CO2 again. So instead of your CO2 levels going down, it can be brought back to normal. Isn't that amazing? What exactly is critical thinking? Common sense thinking. I was about to say, duh. But some students are very offended by saying, duh, I make them look stupid or dumb, but I'm not here to do that. I'm here making you understand that the things we do here have a scientific explanation all the time. A paper bag is designed to make you re-inhale the CO2 so that you will have solved the problem, right? And you sedate the patient and provide mm -hmm. counseling. Here the problem is hyperventilation. What you're supposed to do is, as if you're doing gold mining, 200 years ago in, in, in California, gold mining means, what is gold? Precious gemstone. Here, what is gold? The necessary words that you need to know. Golden words of wisdom. If I say bang, anxiety attack, bang, hyperventilation, bang, PCO2 will be what? Less than 35, bang, pH will be greater than 7.45. On the other hand, if I say pneumonia, COPD, any lung condition, bang, respiratory acidosis, bang, pH that is 7.35, bang, PCO2 will be greater than 45. Because you're retaining the CO2. Does that make sense? Now, what about metabolic conditions? Nothing to do with the lung. Are we still good with the recorder? Did I press it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, record. Sometimes I'm talking for one hour and I didn't record Jesus. Okay, I'll be wasting my time. Okay, acidic versus alkalosis. Very simple. When you vomit, where does the vomitus come from? From the stomach? Stomach, acid going out and you have and what's the alkalosis. <coughs> Very good. Metabolic alkalosis. Yeah. Okay. Hydrochloric acid. Pretend it's HCl. Mm -hmm. So when you vomit, where's the acid now? Out. <coughs> On the floor. <coughs> because you got rid of the acid, you become what? Alkalosis. Vomit. Or vomiting, right? Does that make sense? So you would expect the pH to be what? <coughs> 7.35 makes it acidic. On the other hand, when you make poo-poo and have diarrhea, Acidosis. your intestinal and pancreatic secretions are base. They contain, I forgot to mention this, bicarbonate, B for bicarbonate, B for base. B for bicarbonate, B for what? Base. So if you have diarrhea, the base in your intestinal and pancreatic secretions will be base. Where are they now? On the toilet bowl. If the base is in the toilet bowl, you become what? You become acidic. Acidic. Diarrhea. Acidic. pH will be what? Shit. Oh. What did I <laughs> I apologize. 
So alkalosis, how can I be so stupid? Okay, acidic means less than 7.35, alkaline should be what? Greater than 7.45. You understand? Now, what about the patient who's diabetic, especially type 1, wherein there is absolutely no insulin and the sugar or glucose is not able to enter the cell. The cell has to use an alternate source of energy called fat. And when you use fat as an alternate source of energy rather than glucose, what do you produce? Ketones. And what are ketones? Acid. So, excuse me, it's called diabetic ketoacidosis. So should I put that under acid or alkaline? Acid. What? Acid. Of course. Don't you see how easy it is? It's a game of words. Diabetic what? How can you miss that? See, if I tell you now, a 40-year-old female patient was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus, bam! Re metabolic acidosis, why? Because of DKA, then you would expect the pH to be less than 7.35, right? So you need to treat the infection, how? I don't know, treat the what? The diabetes by giving what? Insulin, okay? Does that make sense? And give the medications. In other words, control the blood sugar. You understand why, okay? Is that clear? The idea, therefore, is that there are a lot of other conditions, but the important thing is that if it's the lung, respiratory. Other, other than that, so you will notice here what organs or systems are involved. Kidney. You have the what? Endocrine. Pan pancreas, right? What else? GI, okay? And of course, GI, and of course, in kidney. Now the kidney, the good thing about the kidney, it works hand in hand with all these other organs. I'll give you an example. I, I will not anymore cover the compensatory mechanisms. It's very simple. If the patient is acidic because of this problem of pneumonia and everything, you're acidic, right? What do you think will the kidney do? The kidney has the capacity to either what? Excrete bicarbonate in the urine, or retain the bicarbonate in the blood and in the body. If you're acidic, what did I say about bicarbonate? What's the first letter of bicarbonate? B. What is the first letter of base? B. Is this a base? Yeah. Yes, it is. It has the capacity to accept a hydrogen ion. An acid, just like hydrochloric acid, can donate a hydrogen ion. That's the definition of acid in basic chemistry. So, when the patient is acidic, how does the kidney compensate because of the problem in the lung? The kidney will just do one thing. Because you're acidic, what will it do? Will it retain the bicarbonate or will it get rid of the bicarbonate in the wee wee or urine? Retain. Of course, you're so smart. Yes, that is compensation. How is compensation performed? Through the actions of the kidney. Bicarbonate is base, so it will retain the bicarbonate to bring back the pH back to normal between 7.35 to 7.45. On the other hand, if you are hyperventilating, developing alkalosis, what will the kidney do with the bicarbonate? Excrete. Retain or excrete in the wee wee? Excrete. Excrete in the urine. As simple as that. Do not make things complicated in life. The word complicated is only used in Facebook. You get a joke, it's okay. okay. Relationships, complicated. Okay. Now, do you understand class? Now, let's move on. You raise this. Let's talk about COPD and CRLD, right? Let's start with COPD first. COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. You can either have asthma, Bronchitis, and then what? Emphysema. Some books would use uh, bronchiectasis, but these are the three most top three. Can anybody tell me where exactly is the problem in asthma? Is it in the larynx, trachea, bronchitis, bronchi, or is it bronchioles or air sac? Where? Okay, bronchioles. You are absolutely right, my dear. Why? What happened in asthmatic patients? Who's asthmatic here? 
Anybody who's asthmatic in this class? A patient who's asthmatic is exposed to an allergen such as what? The pollen, the hair of the cat, the hair of the dog, or the paint. Once you're exposed to the allergenic substance, it causes the smooth muscles here to what? Contract in the bronchioles. You end up with bronchial what? Spasm. And what does that lead to? Bronchial constriction. Right? And whenever there is bronchial constriction, it is a form of what? Airway obstruction. It is all for obstruction. But what kind of obstruction? Reversible or irreversible? Reversible, because you can make the muscles relax. So, there is wheezing. There is difficulty of breathing. It's called dyspnea. What does this mean? Difficult. And what does nya mean? Breathing. Nya. Breathing. This. Difficult. So what is this? Difficulty. Difficulty of breathing. Just like when you say a patient has SOB. What is SOB? Son of A? Okay. Shortness of? Breath. Breath. Of course. What about apnea? What does A mean? Without. What is apnea there for? Without breathing, we stop breathing, just like when you have sleep apnea, right? Yeah. How many of you have sleep apnea here? Stop breathing, okay? So that's, that's be, be sure you know all the nyas in the world. Orthopnea, hyperpnea, bradypnea, gamopnea, and there's no sadness. <laughs> Okay, so what about bronchitis? Where is the problem with bronchitis? It's obvious, it's the bronchi. It's inflamed. People who smoke. How many of you smoke here? How many of you smoke here? You smoke how many cigarettes a day? The two of you? How many cigarettes a day? Too much. Too much. What about you? How many cigarette sticks a day? Oh, oh. Is it pack of cigarettes or just cigarette sticks? One pack, two packs a day? Okay, it's okay. So if you smoke, guess what? You have two choices. Either you develop COPD or cancer. The problem is, I'm just, I'm just joking, of course. I'm not trying to, you know. When you smoke, is it good for you? Obviously not, right? You are in the healthcare profession. You should be the prime example of not smoking. But I know when you are, when I have a friend, a lot of friends, my doctor friends, my classmates in med school, I said, are you supposed to be, be the model, right? But, and they're, they're surgeons, so they have a lot of stress, so, you know. Uh, they have five families, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, my friends will kill me now. <laughs> I, I just attended this convention in San Francisco. I was upset for the whole week, last week, because some of my friends were there. It's my classmates in medical school, they're all over the U.S., they're practicing medicine, and they have so much stress. So me, no stress. No. I just teach in a medical school, a nursing school, them, they practice. They have a lot of high insurance that they have to cover me. Relax, chill, chill, you know. <laughs> so when they smoke, guess what? You destroy what? What do you destroy when you smoke? The cilia. cilia. The cilia was supposed to what? Clear the mucus. Mm -hmm. So remember this? Remember in anatomy we talked about the cilia here? Like there's seaweed. <laughs> and what do the cilia do? The cilia move like this. If I were the cilia, <laughs> And this is the mucus. What is this? Mucus. Mm -hmm. Cilia 1 will pass into cilia 2. Hi, cilia 2. Hi, cilia 3. Mm -hmm. So cilia 1 to cilia 2, cilia 3, and cilia out. But when you smoke, guess what? You destroy the cilia. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to make the mucus of phlegm come out? No. no. They will be retained here. And what will that mucus do? Obstruct the airway in the form of a mucus plug. That's the reason why, again, there is what? Airway obstruction here. So smoking is bad. Not only for you, but for me, why? Because I get secondhand smoke. Yeah. You understand? Now, so observe therefore that when we're dealing with these conditions, we need to know the problem. Here is the bronchioles in asthma. In bronchitis, it's the bronchi. 
What about emphysema? Can anybody tell me where is the problem in emphysema? Alveolar. Alveolar wall. The wall. Mm -hmm. The air sac wall. So this is the capillary here with the exchange of gases. The capillary contains blood, air sac contains air. Can anybody tell me, summarize in one or two sentences, what is happening in emphysema patients? Yes? The air sacs are swollen. Okay. Collapse, yes, yes. Alveolar walls. The alveolar wall. What happened to the alveolar wall? They get destroyed. Why are they destroyed? So you notice I always have a follow-up question to every answer, yes? Why would the alveolar wall become destroyed? Permanently, irreversible. Yes, are you raising your hand, my dear? Are you just stretching your arm? Okay, I said. Is it due to abnormal enlargement? Enlargement, yes. Yes? Is it alpha Okay, elaborate. I like you. I must say I don't like the other answers, but uh, if this were a thread on Facebook, you are in the right thread. You are reading the same books, but everybody has different opinions, right? But what is what trying to converge to an answer? Alveolar wall is correct. It's damaged. It's destroyed irreversibly. People who have what? Deficiency of what? Antitrypsin. Alpha? Give me an alpha. Give me a one. Give me an anti. Give me a trypsin, right? So it is a deficiency in what? Alpha, one, anti, what? Trypsin. Okay, so what? Can anybody explain? The answer is correct. Even if the answer is correct, but if you do not understand what exactly it means, it's you'll still be in deep stool. Yes, my dear. Your answer is correct. Of all the almost 30 students in this class, you're the only one who gave me the right answer. And you might even pass the nursing board exam. I'm just over this question only. But you will pass only if you can explain to me how can it be possible that you destroy the alveolar wall if you have deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin. There is one paragraph in your book that talks about that. Anybody? Proteolytic enzymes. Okay, very good. At least we're getting somewhere out here now. <laughs> proteolytic enzyme. Is trypsin a proteolytic enzyme? Yes. So when you say proteolytic, just mucolytic, lytic means breakdown of what? What particular substance in the wall of the alveolus that is broken down? Proteo. Protein. What? Protein. Of course, my goodness. Don't you love anatomy and physiology? It's always a game of words. Proteo, protein, lytic, destroys the protein component of the alveolar wall. Oh my gosh. Now, alpha anti, what is anti? Against the enzyme, which is harmful. The proteolytic enzyme. What is anti? Against the bad enzyme. Anti. Against. So you need a lot of these to protect yourself. But in this patient, the problem there is what? Deficiency. In other words, if you do not have enough of this substance, alpha-1 antitrypsin, you will be prone to what? In other words, not everyone who smokes develops emphysema. Only those people with what? Only with what? Only with what? Only with what? Only with what? Of which one? Can you be able to measure your alpha-1 antitrypsin levels? Yes? Yeah. The two ladies who smoke. Come back next week, tell me your values, and I'll tell you what happened to you. I'm trying to talk like an Indian now, okay? After watching all these YouTube movies. Yes, my dear. Yeah. It's amazing, right? If you have deficiency here, you know the problem. So if you smoke. I don't smoke. You said you smoke, is it? You raised your hand. Yeah. You were just joking? No. <laughs> okay. I thought you were. Oh, she's just joking. So, so you're the only person who smokes in this class, dear, my dear. 
Yeah. But it's okay. If you have a lot of stress in life, but if you can stop it, good for you, okay? Because it will add more stress on your part because it affects your body. And you also add more stress to me and the rest of the class because you're gonna... But, so every time I, I see that uh, people smoking there in the parking structure, every time I park my car, they go, Dr. Gamo! And I said, hi! <laughs> Do I go to them or we go away from them? Away. Although I like the smell of smoke. That I know what that can do for my what? My, my cilia, right? Anyway. Now, the idea therefore is that all three of them have area of traction. Which one is irreversible? What about this two? Irreversible. The damage will become permanent. Okay? Do you understand? Now, treatment, very easy. Can we give bronchodilators? Yes. Can we give mucolytic drugs? Yes. Can we nebulize the patient nebulization? Or breathing treatment? Yes. Can we do pulmonary therapy? Yes. Can we give treatment for infection? Yes. Can we give inhalers, like especially here? Yes, we do. Right? Particularly like albuterol or terbutalin or salbutamol. These are all bronchodilators. If you do not work with these inhalers, we can do epi. You have heard of EpiPen? Mm -hmm. EPI stands for epinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline. Is it a bronchodilator drug? Yes. Part of our neurotransmitter for sympathetic nervous system. Do you understand? Okay. So, do you understand about COPD now? In patients with status asthmaticus, that means they do not respond to the inhaler, they do not respond to the EpiPen, then we have to what? Give them what? Steroids mm -hmm. as a form of treatment. It's anti-inflammatory. The only problem is that what are steroids known to be? Immunosuppressants, so they could have infection. They're anti-inflammatory, but good for asthmatic patients. Now, in CRLD, restrictive lung disease, the most common would be what? Pneumothorax. What is pneumothorax? Anybody? Hmm? Can anybody tell me what is exactly pneumothorax? Anyone? Air. Air where? Between. Air in the lung cavity. Remember, in the anatomy of the lung. The lung is surrounded by a serous membrane mm -hmm. called pleura. The heart is surrounded by a serous membrane called pericardium. The pleura has two layers, the visceral and the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is on the surface of the thoracic wall rib cage. The visceral pleura is on the surface of the lung, all over the lung. There is a space between the parietal pleura on the thoracic rib wall and the visceral pleura on the surface of the lung. It's called the pleural cavity. What is found inside the pleural cavity is what? Pleural serous fluid. Serous membranes secrete fluid. The pleura secretes the fluid, the visceral and parietal pleura. How thick should this fluid be? Paper thin. What is the purpose of the fluid there? Lubrication. And what is the purpose of lubrication? To reduce what? Friction. It's like your natural KY, right? Yeah. You use KY to reduce friction. The same thing. Every time you inhale, thank you, pleural fluid. I always say that. Don't you do that? In my prayer, I love to thank the lung and the pleura for exchange of gases taking place. That's why I'm alive. Every time I wake up, I thank the heart, the, or the heart and the lungs. I'm just joking, of course. We always are thankful for the organs that we have, right? Now, air, air. How can air enter the pleural cavity? Can anybody tell me? Yes? That's us what? What kind of injury? Be more specific than just injury. Yes. Gunshot wound. Have you been shot before? You want to be shot now? I'm just joking. What about stab wounds? Have you been stabbed before? Okay, who wants to volunteer? I can stab you with this. So once you hit somebody here, what happens to the air outside? The air outside goes inside. Why? Because I created an opening. Because I stab you. Right? You want me to stab you? So that you become awake? You probably did not sleep well last night, right? You were busy studying for this midterm exam? See, go ahead. What about the broken rib? Can that also cause? Yeah. Of course. Can you have a, what is hemothorax? Blood. Blood. 
Okay, now what, why is this dangerous, class? Tell me. See, you have to explain. So this is how you become smart. A smart person is able to explain the questions of what, where, how, when, why. Why is it that when you have pneumothorax, hemothorax, you can actually die? Lung can collapse. The lung can collapse. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? Why will the lung collapse? So this is your, let's pretend this is your, your lung on the right, right? Three lobes. The left, two lobes. Two lobes, yeah. This is the plura, rib cage. Mm -hmm. It's a lobe here. Okay. It's a dive from here. So if you have air entering here, what happens? In the plural cavity, it occupies Positive. space. Positive. The moment the air occupies the space, it will push what? Lung. The lung to one side. What used to be a big lung becomes what? A small lung. A small lung. Why? Because it's not occupied by air. Mm -hmm. Or even blood. It's called, what is atelectasis? Does anybody know what is atelectasis? Lung okay, collapse. Okay, what's a lung collapse? That's absolutely what it is. So when the lung collapses, what happens to the air sacs? They will what? Deflate. It's like a balloon. You have millions of these, and when there's blood or air, what does it do? It makes the air sac what? Shrink. Collapse, Collapse, shrink, deflate, like a balloon that deflates. So when the air sac will deflate, will there be exchange of gases no. taking place? No. That's how you die. So what do you think Dr. Gamma would do? I would insert a chest what? Something. Chest tube. Mm -hmm. And then hook it up into a what? To the floor okay. evac. Device with calibration, and I, I'll tell you this: When I was nursing, doing a nursing review for students from 2002 to 2008, there were a lot of questions of these. And why do doctors perform a chest tube insertion? Chest tube, tube to drain what? The blood and air. Blood for hemothorax, air for pneumothorax. Or can you have a combination of both? Pneumo hemothorax. Yes, you can. Do you understand? You want to drain because it's making the lung collapse. The moment you remove the blood, this will re-expand. That's one way of saving the life of the patient. Now, if the blood is continuous, how would you know? Because the, this, this device will continue to have blood in them. If the blood accumulation does not stop, that means there is something that's bleeding inside. What do you do? You do surgery. You come in, bring the patient to the operating room. You could actually bleed to death if you don't do anything. You understand? Okay. Now, what about pneumonia? Pneumonia and tuberculosis of the lung. Tuberculous pneumonia. Can that also be a form of CRLD? Mm. Now, mycobacterium tuberculosis, as you probably learned in your microbiology lectures, is an organism that is spread by what? Air. Airborne droplet spray, right? And there are a lot of diagnostic tests. What is the name of the test that we use to determine whether you were exposed or not to tuberculosis? The what? Maltus test. How do you spell it? M-A-N-T... M-A-N-T-O-U-X. It's yeah. French. Yeah, Maltus. Manto, okay. What is the name of the test? Manto. The Manto test it's a test of a skin, it's a skin test wherein you inject the patient. What do we inject the patient with? Active uh, bacteria of TB. Some it's live attenuated, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a portion of, the, portion of yeah. the, the tuberculous bacteria. But what is the name of that? You mean I tell the nurse, inject. What, what, what will you inject? PPD. Huh? PPD. PPD. What does PPD stand for? Inject with PPD or tuberculin, right? Tuberculin. Okay. What is the what is this? Or tuberculin. Tuberculin or PPD. What does PPD stand for? It stands for what? Purified. Purified protein, protein, protein derivative. Perfect. Do you understand? How would you know if the response is positive? Redness. redness. There is not is it just redness? What's the key word? Induration. Induration. Very good. What is induration? It should be raised, elevated, and it should be hard or hard? Hard. hard. And how, what is the diameter? 10. 10 millimeter. Did I discuss it in class already before? I think I did. I'm not so sure. 
10 mm. 10 mm. So are you going to have with you a tape measure or a ruler? Or just eyeball measurement? No, don't do that. Get this tape measure and put that in the chart. Positive for what? 12 mm, which is positive. Indurated means raised, elevated. And when is the fastest or earliest time you would tell them to come back? 48 hours. So if I inject 7 a.m. of Monday, I will expect her to be back when? Wednesday, 7. Wednesday at 7 a.m. That's the earliest possible time to be considered proper. Okay? 48 hours, two days. Do you understand? Okay? Now, once if it's positive, it tells you that this particular person is he sick of TB or he has only been exposed? exposed. Exposure. And what do you do? What's the next step? X-ray. Chest X-ray. Will you be able to see those pneumonic infiltrates? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, what is better than a chest X-ray? Blood test, I believe. That was the name of the test. Hmm? It's now a new blood test. Blood I, test I heard. Yeah. yeah, what's the name? Quantiferin. Huh? Quantiferin. Quantiferin. Yes. How do you spell it? You know? Um, Q. -O -S. Q. Quantiferon, right? So, yeah. so it's a blood test. Another one is what? What else? Sputum CS, of course. Sputum culture and sensitivity testing, but you have to use a special type of culture, culture medium for tuberculosis. Do you understand? I would also say, or I used to do this when I was in medical school. The sputum, A, have you heard of AFB? Acid, fast, bacilli stain. If you have a patient with tuberculosis infection, you spit, not spit, but you cough out the sputum, you end up with what? Acid, fast, bacilli stain. It's positive, it becomes red or orange on the, on the microscopic slide specimens. Is that clear? Okay. What else? What about scoliosis? Can that lead to this? And why? See, she always asks me, why? Well, you know, the spine is straight, normal people, right? If your spine is curved like this, what happens to the rib cage? Mm -hmm. It rotates. And when the rib cage rotates, it affects the expansion of the lung. It restricts, that's why it's called restrictive lung disease because it will restrict what? The breathing patterns of the patient. Do you understand? Okay? Is that clear, class? Now, I'm almost one o'clock, one hour, so I'll have to stop in a short while. The other thing you also need to know about in this chapter, I think, what about fluid balance, right? Overload and deficit. The most important thing to remember is this. Fluids could either be what? Overload or what? Overload or what? Okay. Start with deficit first. I start with the GI tract. When you have what? Diarrhea? What else? Vomiting? You're losing what? Water. Water through the vomitus and what? So you're not able because the peristalsis is so fast there was no time to reabsorb the wall in the large intestine. The water. Okay? What else? When you have what? What is polyuria? So G digestive tract, re re renal, renal yeah. kidney. So what can lead to polyuria? Can that be due to diabetes mellitus? Yes. Mm -hmm. Diabetes insipidus? Yes. Can that be due to Addison's disease? Yes. Yes. What happens in Addison's disease? Patients with Addison's disease, there is what? Low aldosterone. What is the opposite of Addison's disease? Cushing. Overload, Cushing's. Oh, yeah. What happens in Cushing's disease? Overload. High levels of what? Aldosterone. Aldosterone is elevated and therefore you retain what? Water and sodium. Wherever sodium is, water will follow. So if you retain water, you develop what? Overload. You would expect the weight to go up because when you look, remember, 66% of your body weight is water. People with fluid overload, your weight will go up. Your blood pressure will go up because you have what? 
hypervolemia, high levels of blood volume. Okay, going back to this. Insipidus, what's the problem? Too much water. Polyuria, what becomes out? Why? What is the problem in diabetes insipidus? Which hormone is affected here? ADH. ADH, very good. ADH is produced by the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and this hormone, just like aldosterone, will promote water what? retention. retention. By the kidney. Just like aldosterone, by the kidney. So here, high levels or low levels of ADH? No. Hmm? No. Of course, low. Down. That's the reason why they're not able to retain the water. The water goes out in the wee wee. Fluid volume deficit. Now, what is the opposite of diabetes insipidus? Now, there's no more time. Can I answer my own question? I will. It's called SIADH. In here, you have what? High ADH. And it stands for what? Syndrome. You know how to spell syndrome, eh? Or syndrome, right? S-Y-N-D-R-O-M-E. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH. It's high levels. So what do you do here? Retain what? Water. Water by the kidney. And that's the reason why you have fluid volume overload. Now, what else? Anything that has to have word failure, like what? Heart failure, liver failure, and kidney failure. So how do you know that they have all these? Have you ever seen their feet? They're swollen because they're retaining water. Bipedal edema. What else? In heart failure, you have what? Pulmonary edema. Yeah. Especially left-sided. It came out, you studied this part, right? Last week? Left-sided, L for left, L for la, lung. Okay. Uh, for um, left side of the heart, okay? Now, what else? Kidney, same thing. It regulates your fluid volume. And of course, liver. People with ascites. What is ascites? Accumulation of water in the peritoneal. Accumulation of water in the peritoneal cavity. You have ascites. A-S-C-I-T-E-S. -E How what about kidney failure? Periorbital edema. Moon phase. Same thing. You end up with water retention in these patients. You see the difference? Now, what's the treatment? Very simple. If you are in deficit, you are dehydrated, what do you do? Replace mm -hmm. the fluids. I forgot to mention, what's the most common here too? Burns. It's very common. Mm. A patient with burn injury, OMG. They have fluid volume deficit, they become dehydrated. The first organ that will be affected will be the kidney. You end up with renal failure and renal shutdown. You become oliguric. Whenever we have patients with fluid deficit, they can develop hypovolemia. Why? Because the moment you lose fluids or water, water is a major component of your plasma in the blood. You lose water, the blood volume goes down. It's called hypovolemic shock. The key principle, therefore, is make sure you replace the water or fluids in the body. In burn patients, you're dealing with two major problems. One is dehydration due to fluid volume deficit, burnt, and second is what? Overwhelming what? Infection. Because you do not now have any more protection to your body when you burn your skin. Okay? Okay, I'll give you five minutes to, to chill and relax and go to the restroom, and I will be giving your midterm exam in five minutes, okay?